with Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is a man of the Pharisees, and he's, a, he's part of the ruling uh, elite in the Jewish tradition at the time, and, and Jesus has this interchange with him that I think it, it really teaches us a lot about the kingdom of God and about who we are and about who Christ is. So, from John chapter 3, <coughs> now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Pastor Dutch. Loving God, we uh, pray for your word. And we pray, Lord God, that your word will be imprinted indelibly into our hearts. And I ask, O oh Lord, that you use Pastor Ryan to do that. So Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear. We may help give us, Lord God, divine wisdom, wisdom from above. May we treasure your word in our hearts. And we ask, Pastor, we ask you to bless Pastor Ryan by the power of your spirit. Amen. <coughs> Amen. All right. <clears throat> How many of us like second chances at things? Okay. Amen. Okay. Um, I think as a culture, um, not, matter of fact, not even just our culture, I, I don't want to speak for every culture because I don't know every culture on the planet, but I think it's part of the human condition to like a redo in life. Thank God. Yeah, thank yeah. God for <laughs> redoing in life. You're feeling that, Aaron, and, and I hear you, right? If we think about our jobs, if you mess up an assignment, isn't it nice when the boss says, hey, take another crack at it, right? Take another try, and you're like, ooh, got out of that one. Or if you, know, if you have kids, right, and they, I, I spent some time in the school system um, as a part-time, you know, kind of a part-time thing um, when we first planted Encountering Ministries, and I, I always remember the kids' faces when we pass out the quizzes and they come up, and the, the quiz is usually folded in half so nobody can see, and they come up and they say, um, excuse me, are we allowed to take a, a makeup quiz, a retake, right? Because you know right then and there they are not too happy with that grade. And oftentimes the teachers would say, all right, go ahead, look at your mistakes, and I'll let you retake it. We are a people who love grace when we have relationships after an argument, you know, and, and this is just a little a little thing that I want to start practicing with my wife, and I think it's a great thing for people to do in all types of relationships, okay? When you're in the middle of an argument, it's just to say, stop. Can we start over? Let's let's pray for a minute. And, and it's funny how when you pray, all of a sudden the intensity and uh, the kind of heat just seems to quell. It's like somebody turned the gas off the oven and the boiling water started to just calm down and, and that simmer just started to ease down. I said, can we start again? Can we take another shot at this? If you, um, if you play uh, football or are a fan of football, or you might remember the, the David Tyree catch off the helmet, and I am sure that the Patriots, have, upon ruining their perfect season, wish that they could have had another chance at that game right there. Let me give you kind of the, the classic example. It's called a mulligan. How many people golf? Okay, raise your hand if you golf. Darren, you better raise your hand because he's a good golfer. Okay, I'm terrible at golf. I am awful at golf. I don't claim to be a good golfer. I went golfing just yesterday with a couple people who are in this room right now that I won't mention. But, you know, I stink. And so when I get up there and I hit, you don't even know where the ball is going. I have this, this, this annoying habit of looking my ball. It's almost like it has a sensor for where a person is, and it will go. I yell four more than anybody else on the golf course. One time I hit the ball, last time I went golfing with Darren, it went through the golf cart that he was driving and landed in the basket behind him. True story, Jermaine, will you back me up on that? I'm the type that needs about 14 mulligans. So yesterday, they were very gracious to me, and they said, you know what, Ryan, 
your, your, your ball is out in the woods over here. Why don't you just roll it into the middle of the fairway and keep playing? I think they were just tired of waiting for me. <laughs> but it's a mulligan. It goes back to, to, to the beginning and get a, re a chance again to start something new and pretend that that last thing didn't count. And, and so my question is, if we are a people and human nature loves second chances, why do people become so uncomfortable with the term born again? Because most people's reaction that I've seen to that term, and you're shaking your heads, you know that. You said you're born again. People are like, oh no. You're not one of those born againers, are you? One of those weird people? Absolutely. Are you one of those weird born againers? There's almost this like they, they bracket you into this like legalistic um, type of church environment without even knowing you. And yet Jesus says, we need to be born again. I've had outright Christians who swear that they, that they love Jesus with all their heart, and Jesus says you must be born again. And as soon as you say, I'm born again, they look at you like you just came out of the religious, you know, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, I can't think of the name now. I'm blanking out. The, the Twilight Zone, the religious Twilight Zone, okay? They just look at you funny. Why? We love second chances in life. We love grace. We love another chance and here Jesus says you must be born again listen I, I'm going to tell you this this is, the, this is the truth from my perspective I can remember thinking that that term oh I got to watch when I say that people are going to think this about me or people are going to think that about me I spent after two years in a hospital room looking out a window wondering if life was ever going to be the same again and I can remember saying oh please God Give me another chance at life and give him another chance at life. Because when you lose things, when you hit the bottom of the well, when you're staring out a window in the hospital saying, I don't know, it's been two years, I don't know if this is ever going to end. When you come to the place of desperation, you will cry out for new life. And I can even go so far as to say that unless you, have, you find that place of desperation, you will not understand the grace and the freedom and the joy of what it means to be born again. Can I at least get an amen on that? Amen. What it feels to have life anew. I can remember saying I don't ever want to be a pastor again. I can remember wondering if I'd ever even be in ministry again. I can remember that feeling of desperation saying I don't know this life has just drowned me. And, and here I am, right? And now I have two congregations, which is kind of weird, but this isn't about me. Think about your own lives, right? And you know that place that you get to where you think, oh my goodness, can I get a mulligan on life? Can I start this life over again? Because I don't see where this old self is ever going to end. And I think Jesus speaks words of freedom when he talks about being born again. He speaks words of compassion. He speaks words of grace. He speaks words that should bring us joy. When you spend so much time wondering if there's going to be tomorrow, you start wondering, hey, I don't even know if there's tomorrow. What's the end of my life going to look like? What's the legacy that I'm going to leave? How many know the movie Dead Poet Society? Okay, it's my favorite movie. Dead Poet Society is my favorite movie. And there's this scene where he takes his students and he puts them in front of this, of this picture of, of some classes from many, many year, decades before. Uh, I don't know what graduating class it was. And he says, look in their eyes, boys. They're filled with all these things just like you, all these passions just like you, all these desires just like you, all these hopes just like you. I'm paraphrasing, but to the best of my memory, right? And he goes, you know what? They're all food What's our legacy going to be? What is life going to look like? And in that moment, Jesus speaks these words to us and says, hey, your life has to die for you to find everything that you've ever wanted to come into your heart and be made new. But you first have to learn to die to yourself. And, and so that's what's on my heart today. What it means to die to self what it means to be born anew. The Greek word means to be born anew or literally born from above. It kind of means both. It's a new start, but
but it's born from above. And we find this in the Gospel of John, and it's no surprise because John quotes Jesus all the time about taking this thing that what's from above has broken through, has descended and crashed through time and space into our current reality. John 1.51 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And in John 3.13, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Somehow Christ has done the most amazing thing for us. He's opened up the portal, opened up this, what theologians call this line of transcendence, this distance between heaven and here, this distance between God and man. He's cracked open. And even to go one step farther, this is the real mind blower of today's message coming right out of Scripture. The real you is hidden up there with God still. That new life that we want to taste Somewhere in the mind of God, that is already perfected. If you don't believe me, listen to Colossians. Listen to Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. <coughs> listen to that. Your old self has died. You can say, I don't want to be born again. I don't know. That sounds kind of funny. Listen, Jesus says be born again. And Paul tells us here that the old self has died with Jesus Christ. And the new self in all its glory is hidden in God, hidden in Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say that when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. What an odd but wonderful concept that the real you, Aaron, the real you as God has created you, as God has destined you to be, with all his passions and his hopes for you, all he's destined you to be is already full in God. And he's just waiting, we sit here waiting for that true self to come alive. Wait, what an odd concept for self. I haven't seen you in a while. You know, the true self, we're going to meet him one day, but it's going to be us. What a wild thought that is. That somewhere in the mind of God, Aaron, everything he's called you to be already is in heaven. Chris Richards, everything God has destined for you in this new life in Christ is already in him. I have everything he's called you to be already is. And that's why we as Christians have to be the people above all else who say, who come to that place of humility, who say, Lord, teach me to die to myself. Teach the old to pass. Give me a taste of this new life. Break open the, the boundary between heaven and earth. Break open this divide between the kingdom and the steps that I take on here. And let me taste who I am to become. Let me taste who you've destined me to be. Listen, I've made a lot of plans. I made a lot of destinies for myself. I can remember saying, I will never, ever have the destiny of being a pastor. Never. I looked him right in the eyes. I said, I will never walk down that road, and I will never subject my, my, kids, my kids to be, be a pastor. I will never subject my kids to being pastor's kids. How's that working out for you guys over there? Okay? <laughs> Because we make all types, in the flesh and in our carnal self, we make all types of plans. We make all types of destinies for ourselves. But the Lord God Almighty has written our steps on the canvas of time. The Lord God Almighty knows everybody you're going to be, Darren Roy. Everything you're going to be. Every destiny that he has planned for you. And so we as a people have to look up and say, oh Lord, new life is my fault. And to die to the old is my life. Jesus takes the whole concept. To, to die is to have life. And to live is to live for him. To be born again is to experience the true self in the here and now, even as we wait for it to be fully revealed to us. Give me a taste of my new self. Give me a glimpse of who I'm going to become in you and let me experience life anew. John 1, 9 through 13 says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. 
He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Listen, right here. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. This is the Holy Spirit's work in your life. To deny being born again is to deny new life. To deny being born again is to deny the work of the Holy Spirit, taking the seed of Christ in you and bringing it to full bloom. And when you find that place of desperation and you've had enough and you've reached the end of yourself, new life will be your freedom, not your prison. Amen. When does the caterpillar first realize it was meant for greater things, that it was meant to fly? and begins to contemplate its cocoon and break forwards towards its destiny. How many of you um, know Angie? She's part of our, our ministry here. Let me tell you something. I walked in to do her, her lesson for her baby, and we showed a picture of the baby. Boy, girl. Boy. Yeah. And precious, precious baby. And I'm walking through Bay State Hospital, and as you can probably imagine, it has some bad memories for me. Right? With my child, and I'm going here to bless a child. And all I could think of as I was walking, because that's what the enemy does, he puts that old stuff, that old baggage in your head all the time, doesn't he? Yeah. Take every trauma you have and drill it in your head. Take every heartache you have and drill it in your head. Take every suffering you have and make it think it's your destiny rather than what God has planned for you. That is the way the enemy works in our life. And I'm walking in through these halls, through the children's section, the areas that I've been in with heartache. I'm about to give this blessing to this baby. And, and all I can think of is, Lord, protect this baby from harm. Protect this baby from suffering. Protect this baby from heartache. Right? And, and I get there, and I'm sure Angie would be fine with me sharing this. And, I, and it was so precious this moment. And Angie, if you're watching online, listen, is she online? Good, I got it. Angie, this was the, this was, you blessed me in this, Angie. You thought I was coming to do a baby's blessing, but I looked, I said, how do you want me to bless TJ? How do you want me to bless this baby? Because I don't want to just give you some rote thing that's just printed off of the, of the web. I want to give, what do you want? She, her eyes kind of welled up with tears. Well, that's okay to say, Angie. Right? Right? And she looked at me and she said, with her voice shaking, I want my baby to know God. Amen. Amen. And I thought about how the whole way down, I was just thinking, don't let this baby suffer. Don't let these holes be the reminder that they are in my mind. And then this thought, and obviously we would never wish any of that on anybody, but this thought came to me. If we never let anybody, anything ever happen to them that hurts, if we never let our children experience any heartache or any loss, how will they ever be desperate for God? Amen. Mm -hmm. Because the people that find new life mm -hmm. are not the ones that think they have it all together. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who know how to be desperate. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who know how to hunger, yeah. how to thirst for God. Amen. And it gave me a little different perspective after that. And I've been thinking about that. It's been kind of buried in my head, this idea. You know, Jesus says the most wild, one of the most wild comments in Scripture, okay? And understand it's rabbinic hyperbole. It's, it's an extreme statement to make a point. And he says, whoever loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. See, our desire has to be the butterfly, and we have to get to that point where we hate the life crawling on the ground. And I think something that's misunderstood in this verse is we assume that beauty can't be found here and now because Jesus says you have to hate your life here. No, what he's saying is you've got to realize your destiny is to fly. Your destiny is not to crawl on the ground. Your destiny is to find new life in him, that life that is reborn and already hidden in God right now. Those people will look and they will walk anew here and they will find beauty where they've never found it before. And they will find joy where it never existed before. And they will find and hope where they thought there was not going to be any. Amen. We have to come to a place where we allow ourselves to be desperate. We sang it not that long ago. I'm desperate for you. Mm -hmm. I'm lost without you. Because to those people, being born again is the calling card of the gospel life. It's not one little theological 
side note, to be born anew when you're sitting looking out of that hospital window for two years saying, what is life? Will it ever be new again? And whatever metaphor that means for you, whatever window you've peered out of, whatever heartache's been framed in the curtains of time, whatever that means for you, it's those places of desperation that being born again sounds like the biggest joy and bliss in the world. Do you feel that? Mm -hmm. Don't let anybody tell you anything bad about that term. That term is our hope. That term is what gets us to our knees. That term is what makes us rejoice. See, to the lofty, right, religious man, right, to the, to the fancy things, to the people who have it all together, to the people who are only in it for their own glorification, being born again makes no sense. It doesn't even sound like it would register. The old views are content with life as is. But the new view, the new man, the new man in Christ wants the artist to paint his brush and sketch this canvas anew and say, mold me and shape me, Lord. Turn me into the clay. Let Bring all the walls down, all these things that I've built up, all these walls that I've built up. Swipe them down so that, I, so that you can take that brush and paint a new picture of life and let me see what life is to you because that's what will inform what life is to me. The old views, being born again is a religious gimmick, but the new views it as the essence of the spiritual life. The old views new birth as a physical impossibility, an inconceivable thought to the modern man, but the new man views it as the ultimate reality to which we all must ascend, the mountaintop experience of life set into motion by the one who spun the hands of time. To the old man, new life is a mere metaphor, but to the new man, it is the magnificence of mystery from which deep truths that have been hidden are finally being revealed. The new heart and the new spirit have to break forth from this cocoon in this life that we've spun. We've weaved our own prison in our own heart, but we have to have the courage to leave the cocoon, hear the call to new life, because to the lofty religious man, new life is an end that's been reached for your own glorification, but for the new man in Christ, it's the beginning of life that produces the fruit of the righteousness of Jesus Christ in your life. Amen. We got to hit our knees and say, O oh, painter of time, sketch a new canvas. And until you get that, that place of desperation, you will cling to the canvas of old and refuse to let it go. <laughs> refuse to give it up. There are two things. Listen, for those stuck in the old self, the cross is a reminder of pain from which we must run to continue the excesses of life. But for those who've tasted the new, the cross is the freedom to die, the freedom to be reborn, the freedom to see and hear the Spirit of God at work in your life. And I'm gonna tell you, there are two reasons that you will resist new life. There's two reasons why you'll say, born again, I don't think so. I don't wanna be one of those born againers. I'm gonna give you two reasons before I close. Number one, people fear change. Amen. They fear it. My wife and I have this discussion all the time, right, honey? My wife grew up in a small town, 50 people in your graduating class, all her life. Change comes around, she's like, whoa, I gotta secure this dock here. Me, I'm like, change, where are we going? Let's go, what's new? Right, just two different personalities from two different backgrounds. No one's right, no one's wrong, but people fear change. They wanna hold on to what's old, right? And so we have these voids in our life. And you know what? When you have those voids and those emptiness, it's the new self in Christ that's going to long for the spirit to fill it. Listen, if you're struggling with alcoholism, if you're struggling with alcohol filling that void, what we need to do is to be able to hit our knees and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life and make me new. Paint a new picture on the canvas. If you're struggling with, with depression and anxiety, things I've struggled with in my own life, if you're struggling with ego, with greed, whatever it is, we have to be willing to have humility to say, drop to our knees and say, sketch a new picture because it already exists in you, God, and I need to taste it. I need to see life as you see it. I need to see me as you see it. 
It's the calling card of the modern Christian. Unfortunately, too often will say, give me the kingdom of God, but don't change my life. Give me heaven. Let me taste it, but don't change me until later. Until you hit that place, right? This is one of the best sayings I've ever heard in all of my time in ministry. I learned it from him. When you get to the end of yourself, you've had enough of yourself. You will open your eyes and you will see God. And you won't push away the idea of being born again. You'll hit your knees and you'll say, change, change. Until you're at the end of yourself, you won't change. You'll go back to the same old things and the same old ways of dealing with life until you reach the end of yourself. And there God is. And there the gospel is. There the kingdom is. And there new life is. And that's going to lead me to the second thing that will keep you hitting your knees and keep you from longing to be born again. And that's pride. See, sometimes the caterpillar will look up at the butterfly on a leaf, eating the leaf, way up on a branch, and the caterpillar will say, I'd like to be like that butterfly. And it'll start its trek up the soil, up the tree, up the branch, over to the leaf, and it'll sit right next to the butterfly and say, I made it on my own accord. I did it from my own work. But then that leaf gets eaten up, and that caterpillar has to start that trek all over again, working for it trying to find its own self-worth and its own steps, and the butterfly just takes off. And what that caterpillar doesn't know is it doesn't need to long to be like the butterfly. It can be the butterfly, but you've got to be willing to die to yourself. You've got to be willing to let it go and die to yourself. Pride is the, is the pearl of fake price. When you come to the end of yourself, you're not just going to be okay with change. You're going to long for it. You're ready to trade pride for humility. There's nowhere to go but up. And before I close, I want to, I want to just leave you with this one, I think, perfect analogy about dying to self. Okay? Just, just hear me. I'll give you two more minutes on this because I feel strongly about this. There was this amazing story about a man, and his name was Tony, Tony Bullimore. Tony Bullimore, and he was a yachtsman, he sailed. And he sailed solo through the southern oceans. And he got into a raging sea. And the sea was just whipping him. And the, the waves were overturning him. And he ran, he ran into a rock with his boat. And the boat flipped upside down. And the waves were just battering him. But somehow the cabin of the boat had kind of sealed off where he had air. All right? And the, the, as the tide would roll in, it would rush over to this side and then this side. And it was two degrees Celsius two degrees Celsius, and he started getting frostbite. And he thought, I am never going to make it out of here. And as he stared death in the face, and when he got to the very end, he spent day, I think four days or three days or whatever it might be in there, okay? All of a sudden, one of those uh, those planes, those rescue planes, dropped out of the open door. And he heard it, and he started knocking on the hull. And all of a sudden, the ship came by to rescue him. And he said, this is a quote from him, I tried three times unsuccessfully to get out and get on that life, on my own life craft. And I failed each time. But when I heard that beep, when I, when I knew that hope was there, I got out and I swam and I made it. And this is what he said, no lie. He said, when I was rescued, it felt like I had been born again. I was different with people. I was kinder to people. I found beauty in the world. And do you know how many people who have had near-death experiences tell that same thing? They always come out after a near-death experience and they say, I feel like I've been born again. I feel like I want my life to be different. Listen, spiritually speaking, if you want to find new life, stare at the cross of Jesus Christ and see yourself, your old self, hanging up there. And when you're tempted to look away, stare longer. And when it becomes too much, stare even longer. And sometime as you're looking at that cross and realizing that's your place, Charles Spurgeon had a wonderful quote on this. And you, you know that Pastor Don and I both love Charles Spurgeon. He said, it was the beginning of life for me when I saw Jesus dying on my place, dying in my place. And somehow as you look at that cross and you stare death in the face, 
you will find the courage for new life. Because somewhere, that empty tomb is going to come into view. And you will look for just a minute over that empty tomb. And then you all and I have to make a decision. Are we going to be identified by the old that's hanging there on that cross? Are we going to be identified as a people of the resurrection and walk out of that empty tomb? The choice is ours. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Pastor, help you. Lord God, uh, somebody's here today who needs to hear this. Uh, we believe that you're in charge, you're sovereign. So somebody's heart was turned today. Holy Spirit, work in that heart. I pray that the words that Pastor Ryan spoke, and I pray that the words that you speak through him might enter a heart today, and someone may commit themselves to Jesus Christ. Maybe there's someone that needs to realize they have to die in order to really live. I pray for someone, perhaps, who needs a renewal, who's stuck in a place and doesn't know how to get out of it. I pray, Lord, that they will look to the cross and know that there has to be the death of self in order to be raised from the dead. So, Lord God, I pray today for someone Maybe at the end of this service, they'll come forward, let be led to Christ, or they may need renewal. They need a second chance. Lord, we thank you for this message, but we thank you for your word more. And we ask you, Lord, to call us out to be your servants and your disciples. Oh, Lord, Jesus, you beckon us. You beckon us to come out of our old selves that we might be each and every day growing to be more and more like thee. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen.